Hello, and welcome to our discussion, Identity, Power, and Hope, a reflection on advice from the lights as a part of the Big Read Arts and Ideas Festival in New Haven, Connecticut. Happy Pride Month, everyone. We would like to thank the Big Read Planning Committee for asking us to be a partner this year, and especially to thank Patrick Dunn and the New Haven Pride Center for hosting this virtual talk. We wanted to begin by honoring history and truth. And one way to acknowledge that is the land that we gather on today is the occupied territory of the Quinnipiac, Pawgusset, and Wappinger people. We also acknowledge that this is a panel of white individuals who are coming from various places of privilege, including race, class, and education. We do not represent all individuals or identities on this panel. And we at the P Yale Pediatric Gender Program are currently looking to implement structural changes that will allow our program to be better in conversation with trans folks of color and their organizations. I am Christy Olazewski, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry, Psychology Section at the Yale School of Medicine, and I'm also the Director of the Yale Pediatric Gender Program. I'd like to take a moment to have our panelists introduce themselves as well. I'd like to first bring in Jillian Salentano. Thank you so much, Christy. Hello, everyone. I am Jillian Salentano. I um, am a transgender woman who transitioned about five years ago. I am a psychology major, and I'm in the process of earning my master's in social work to become a therapist for primarily the transgender population. Luckily for me, I was able to intern and interning at the Yale Gender Program, is and that is where I met Christy and everyone, all these amazing people. So I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you. Thanks, Jillian. Next, we're going to bring in Becca Miller. Hi, everyone. I'm Becca Miller. I'm a clinical psychologist and assistant professor at the Yale School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. I also use my own lived experience with um, mental illness and with young onset Parkinson's disease in my work. And I'm really interested in the role of the arts and how they inform the recovery process and a journey and identity for all. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much, Christy, for having me be a part of this. Um, thanks, Becca. And next, we're going to bring in October Moore. Hi, all. My name is October Moore, and I use they series pronouns. I am the chaplain intern at the Yale Gender Program. I am currently attending Yale Divinity School, and my area of interest are the intersection of um, institutional impacts uh, on trans mental health, including the church and Title IX. Awesome. Thanks, October, and welcome. And finally, last but not least, we have Naomi Libby. Hi, everyone. I'm Naomi Libby. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist and psychotherapist. I'm an assistant clinical professor at the Yale Child Study Center and the director, medical director of the Clifford Beers Clinic. Um, and I also consult for the Yale Pediatric Gender Program. Um, and I, I specialize in work with trans youth and with um, the LGBTQ population more generally. Um, I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for agreeing to be here with me today. I look forward to our discussion. Um, first, to start us off, uh, we are going to read one of Stephanie's poems entitled Hermit Crap. Jillian, I am going to um, ask you if you would be so kind as to read the poem. Sure, it would be my pleasure. That shell is pretty. But that shell is too small for me. Each home is a hideout. Each home is a secret. Each home is a getaway under the same hot lamp, a means to a lateral move at low velocity. I live in a room, in the room of a boy I barely see. Sometimes the boy and his talkative friends raise two warm hands and try to set me free. And I, and I retreat back into myself, hoping they place me back into my terrarium. And they do with disappointed alacrity. Scatter patterns in sand, adnate, cancellate, gaping well cuffed, a toy tractor trailer cracked and deemed beside the spine of a plastic tree. 
the helmet-shaped shelter of a shadow cast of a not quite buried wedge of pottery. If I have a body that's wholly my own, then it isn't mine. For a while, I was protected by what I pretended to be. Um, I, it's, it's as a transgender woman, it speaks to me that in a nutshell is me and um, it touches my life very much so. have any other reactions? Um, I, I find, especially um, about protect, about I was protected by what I pretended to be. Mm. And I often say that the person who protected me was the person that I was trying to get away from so badly. And that was before I transitioned, my male self. Um, that was kind of like my lifeboat. I call myself the lifeboat in a very rough and torrent sea, which got me to uh, my island of Jillian. That was my paradise island. But I couldn't have gotten to where I was today without my dead self or my male self. So that says a lot, I think, you know, that that's what how the poem really spoke to me or just one part of it. Mm -hmm. I think the hermit crab also resembles sort of an integration or the beginning of an integration of an identity because at the very beginning she remarks the shell is pretty but the shell is too small for me and I really resonate that especially as a non-binary person um, appreciating and holding my past self as someone who got me here and I hear a lot of that in what Jillian's saying that there is um something beautiful um, and equally very difficult um, about my past self bringing me to this point. And I think that on sort of a religious edge to the hermit crab, I think that there's often this idea that one's community is theirs forever and that one's community of faith or religion or spirituality is going to be their home forever. And there's often, it's often transitions or other hard traumas that sort of bring us to the realization that although this was a good community for one part in my life, it isn't necessarily the shell that's going to move forward with me through my future. Very true, very, very true. I feel the same way as you do that October. Um, I, I also I also like the line of the um, a means to a lateral move at low velocity, and when you're, it's like you're moving, but you're not. It's almost like you're not advancing. You're just existing in a way, at least for me. But again, it's a way of it's it's a way of just existing. It's a way of surviving. Yeah, I think about that in terms of my own experience with mental health problems and and the um, sort of that hiding and, and that, you know, hiding that aspect of my identity and that it protected me in certain kinds of ways. And then when I finally opened up about it and and um, allowed myself to speak on it, it became a source of power. And that was really that that it was sort of it relates in some ways with, that I'm not totally clear this idea of home, like you're sort of carrying your home on your back and then you're exchanging that, you know, for a different, you know, you have to exchange it for a different home. So that really struck me as well. I think from the perspective of, of this being sort of an, uh, an object poem or, or an animal poem in which, um, you know, Stephanie is expressing herself through the eyes of this hermit crab, um, that one of the things that she really conveys is being objectified, right? She's kind of studied and handled quizzically by the little boy um, and his friends. And um, and I think that that speaks to um, an experience that a lot of people share, people who are different in any way, um, being viewed and, and treated as objects. 
Yeah, most definitely. I've had many experiences um, with that myself. Not all bad. You know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it, it's my advantage to, you know, but a lot of the times that it's not, it's very difficult. Um, or, you know, it can be very hurtful too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting question, especially living in sort of today's climate about how we ask trans people to educate us, um, especially black trans women. Um, because when there's sort of like a need for a narrative that often uh, is placed solely on the minority person or the person who is in the um, position of being marginalized. And I just kind of wonder what sort of education about one story looks like without putting the pressure on the marginalized while still being able to give space for their stories. And I think that's, you know, that relates back to the theme of our talk today, right? Is, you know, thinking about identity and how that plays into power and issues of power powerlessness and then hope, right? And thinking about how we can take what we sort of, what identities that we've had that maybe we have not been proud of or, you know, that are marginalized and finding pride in them and also finding hope, right? Um, you know, and that's the theme throughout Stephanie's, throughout Stephanie's poem. Um, and so, you know, sort of starting this off and thinking about a little bit about, um, you know, the, the first part of this and, being, and talking about identity, right? Um, she talks about identity throughout, you know, this either, you know, as, as an object um, or as a person or um, her identity as a girl, um, desired identity as a young person and, you know, being a parent as well. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about from each of your perspectives, uh, what identity, what this means, this idea of identity hmm. and identity development? I, I think for me, um, identity meant definite power. Identity, identity meant um, taking control of my life, finding my happiness, finding my hope. Like all this kind of rolled into one because for so many years, because I transitioned at 55. So for the first 55 of um, you know, my years, I lived in a in a not right i don't want to say the word wrong because i don't put a negative connotation but it wasn't the right identity um for me and it really held me back it really i was quieted i was muted i was afraid to speak up i was afraid of everything because um i was i wasn't being myself mm -hmm. but when i transitioned and my identity came through it was an awakening and i always say that i've lived more life in the last five years than I did in the first, first 55 years because of my identity. And, um, and I just, I just feel unstoppable. Like I said, I went back to school and I, and I love getting educated and, and I found my passion to help, you know, the trans community. Um, and this is all because I connected with my identity. So that, in a very quick nutshell, what identity at least is doing and means to me. And we love your passion, Jillian. <laughs> can you tell? <laughs> yeah, I can speak to um, kind of identity from a, a developmental perspective. Um, and identity development, it's a complex process um by which people develop um a sense of themselves as individuals within the context of cultural demands and, and societal norms um and it was historically viewed as a you know linear succession through discrete phases um and even you know mostly occurring in childhood and adolescence and maybe not even beyond into adulthood um, but we know this is a, an oversimplification, and in fact, identity development is uh, multidimensional, it's fluid and dynamic, um, and it lasts, you know, it happens throughout the entire lifetime. Um, adolescence is a critical period. It's, it's sort of a central psychological task of adolescence to begin to integrate memories and experiences, relationships and values um, cultural context into a sense of self. And ideally that sense of self remains somewhat stable over time, 
which doesn't mean that it, it doesn't change, right? As it incorporates um, new ideas, new experiences. Um, and, um, and, and this happens again over the course of, of a person's lifetime. Um, and gender identity in particular, I know we're gonna be talking about that a lot today. So gender identity development starts quite young. Um, and there are people for whom it, it's pretty firmly established at a pretty young age. And this is true for cisgender people um, whose uh, gender identity aligns with their, their birth assigned sex. It's also true for some transgender people. Um, and but there are other people for whom gender identity development is you know, a little bit more um, fluid and dynamic than that. Um, and that's normal. Um, some people will say, you know, about an adolescent who comes in and says, you know, I'm trans or, um, in, in some way, not, not identifying as cisgender will say, well, they can't possibly know yet. You know, they're too young. How could they know yet? Um, and I think that's, it's interesting because I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that about a cisgender person. They can't possibly know that they're cis. Um, <laughs> but you know, regardless, the, the most important thing um, that, that people need is um, for those around them to be affirming and supportive as they do go through their you know, identity development um, and transformation. Yeah, what I really appreciated what, about what you said is sort of that Naomi is pointing out how dynamic development is and I really resonate that, especially from sort of a religious perspective and how religious growth can look so nonlinear. Um, there's often points in which uh, somebody will be in a religious community, something traumatic will happen, and then they'll go through a stage of wondering for a really long time and then perhaps or not return to that community. And I think that that can happen over and over again. It can happen once, it can happen not at all. Um, and spiritual journeys are so tied to things like our gender identity, which are so dynamic and fluid. So I think the more that we can embrace sort of a dynamic and fluid spirituality, the better that we can embrace like trans spirituality. I, on sort of another note, because I, I feel like I'm speaking sort of from this religious perspective and also from a non-binary perspective, I think it's really interesting to talk about this sense of um, development in a non-binary identity where there's not as much sort of a goal. Um, and that's not to say all the binary trans people are working towards a particular goal, but I think that there's definitely some more like teeter-tottering in a non-binary identity that makes it so it's perhaps even more dynamic um, and even more beautiful. I think that really strikes me as well, the dynamic nature of it and thinking about, you know, the idea of, of the journey, not the end point piece. And really for, I think from a mental health perspective for myself, like with developing mental illness or what was diagnosed as mental illness, I thought at first that it meant I would return to a state of what I previously was or that I had this, you know, that I was working towards like being somehow normal to use that were very loosely in, in in very big quotations, but that and that and that I had to discover for myself that you know it was really about self acceptance in so many different ways, and that um, and it, and part of that was accepting my thoughts as you know not necessarily you know a real thing, but a thought being a thought, and that that sort of what's been really helpful to me. One of the things that's been very helpful to me as well as, um, you know, when thinking about identity for me, you know, I about um, 10 years ago was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, which was another, you know, trying to uh, assimilate this identity as having a chronic health condition that's, you know, um, gets progressively worse. And that, you know, trying to adjust my identity to that and having like a previous self that was um, not had these problems. And then how do I integrate that into my life? Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's been so helpful for me is thinking of it as, you know, like just taking it day by day and, and, and really like looking at sort of I mean, thinking about hope and th that that is so important and finding 
nourishment in, in all kinds of things around me. I, and I have a, a I want to read just a few lines from one of the poems called Water Strider. Was, we were actually out on a hike yesterday and saw some water striders, so this was especially poignant to me. But one of the lines is, I could look down at myself if I let myself reflect on my reflection endlessly and make a depression of every sunny day. And just thinking of that as like sort of getting outside of myself is one of the things that is really helpful to me, not just constantly, you know, that self-reflection is important and certainly psychologists would favor that, <laughs> but, but, but that also being able to look outside of yourself, either through, you know, helping others or, you know, um, or art or other, other aspects of life that become so important. And I think that's especially hard in this time, many of us, you know, being isolated at home, mm -hmm. that it can, it can lead to sort of a more turning inwards and how do we kind of turn outwards again? Really, really important point, Becca. You know, um, I think, you know, thinking about how do we sort of reach out and how do we turn outward? You know, how do we find hope? How do we, um, you know, which is something that we've talked about, I know, as a group, um, you know, thinking about things as, um, you know, more of a journey rather than an end point. You know, these are all pieces of uh, the work I think that we're doing on a daily basis ourselves and also, you know, trying to really, you know, help our, you know, help others think about that as well. Um, you know, I, I know that we have talked a lot about um, this endpoint versus journey. Uh, and one of the things that we oftentimes talk about in the gender program is, you know, someone's gender journey. And uh, and we don't know sometimes what the outcome is gonna be. And, you know, but we support folks in, you know, in their journey, whatever that is. And I think Becca, you know, that goes to your point about, you know, a journey um, in, in multiple areas, right? Um, about illness and thinking about wellness and thinking about, you know, how do we feel power and how do we feel confident in our, in our own self. And I'm just curious, you know, uh, Related to that, you know, if there were any other thoughts that folks wanted to share on sort of intersection of all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed, um, and Stephanie did a, an interview as part of this whole series, and, and for people who haven't seen it, I really encourage you to check it out. Um, and I, I really enjoyed hearing her, her talk about this, and it resonated for me both personally and professionally. Um, she has a, there's a line in her poem, Final Exam, Stephanie, um, you have to look forward to until. Um, and I think this speaks beautifully to the idea that, um, you know, of the journey as opposed to the end point. A lot of people come into therapy feeling lost um, and looking for help getting to a particular destination, thinking that if they can just get there, they'll be happy. Um, and much of the work in therapy is coming to understand that there isn't a static endpoint that one reaches in life. Um, you know, that we're, we're constantly moving and changing um, and, and, you know, the journey is ongoing. Um, you know, it's an aphorism. Life is a journey, not a destination. And it's, it may be trite, but I think it's, it's quite true. Yeah, I think that that fits really well into sort of my understanding of sort of being in a trans body of sort of this equal paradox between joy and struggle um, and sort of those in constant movement with each other. So for instance, um, in Stephanie's poem, My 1970, My 1979, she writes, I was deceived by the body that I mistook for bad penny by the shimmering beauty of my immediate peers which I mistook for fame. And I think what's really beautiful about these lines is it really describes how it's constantly a journey of finding things that you didn't realize about yourself, specifically about your gender identity that are beautiful and sparkling. And all of a sudden you are called by the right name or you put on the right shirt or whatever it may be. And you're like, wow, like there's some joy here. And I think rather than a sort of ideal being the goal, I think that that gender joy is a really beautiful thing to work towards. I love that October. That, you know, I might use that 
I'll, I'll give you credit. Don't worry. <laughs> Let's work towards your gender joy. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so one of the other things that um, is oftentimes discussed in, in, in Stephanie's book is this idea of power versus powerlessness, right? Um, and we can observe that with youth and in our daily lives. Can you talk a little bit about um, each of you from your own perspective, um, this idea of power versus powerlessness? Yeah, I think that carries kind of right over from what you were saying and this sort of gender joy as being a source of power. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really notable. I think the highest percentage I've seen is trans people take up or have about four to five percent of the population or something like that. And that's an extremely high number that I've seen. And that on weeks like last week where it's really hard to be trans can feel very powerless because how can this small percentage of the population advocate and get rights and all these big, big tasks. Um, and I think that there's power not only in like the beauty and strength that is being trans, but I also think that there's strength and beauty in the community and that really power rather than coming from within can come from one's community and from being who one truly is. Think for my um, mental. Oh, go ahead, Julie. Go ahead. Okay. I was going to say, from a mental health perspective, I think that it, it, the word powerlessness also evokes for me hopelessness, worthlessness, and helplessness, which are like all kind of these symptoms of considered symptoms of depression, but I think also like relate to feeling powerless, and 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 they they can kind of interact with those, and and so I think that there's something about like learning your own power and taking that power back that can help you with those other pieces. And they're all kind of intertwined in this way that I think can be really sometimes tricky to, you know, pick out one strand over the other to um, really help yourself. But I think for me, like the, um, the, the taking back of my own identity and like acknowledging that and being, you know, even when, um, you know, I am, so I, I had the experience of having the paramedics called on me because um, someone didn't know what was going on with my movements, and and um, and and it was real. It was a very upsetting experience. And so after that happened, I made these business cards that basically explained my situation, and I had available. And so it was like this taking back of power for myself that you know, I've only used them a couple of times, but it was like okay, now I have something that in my hand that I can like actually show to people, kind of reclaim that um, and and. Um, so that was just one example that it evoked for me and it helped me feel more like powerful, but also less, less hopeless. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, um, it was, it was funny cause I went through a lot of different, all kinds of transitions and with the powerlessness, I used to use that as an excuse and I felt like I was a victim, like, well, I have no power over it. How can it's it's useless i have no power over how i you know how tall i am i have no power you know what i all these things and i used to hide behind it and it was comforting and it was much easier to hide behind something you have no power over. however however it's important to realize that take advantage of the things you do have power over but also the things you do not have power over then you learn how to manage and you learn how to get you you can get power over the powerless and i i'm more like i guess more ob like objects for me like for instance i was always worried about my height when i transitioned i don't want to be 5'10 i want to be you know 5'3 blah, blah, blah. but then i realized well buy clothes that accentuate a tall woman and so i took a i took power over something powerless um and that's what I do now. You know, when, when these circumstances happen, um, I know it's not perfect. I know if I get clocked or something, I have no power over that. But I, I learn, I take from and I learn it. And what can I do? How can I process it the next time? So when you can take 
when you can take your powerless situations and realize you can manage them and you you can you can't change them but you can manage them into your into a positive position um that's a great gift to learn it's a great technique to learn and that's been a huge part of my transitioning and, and for me being happy and loving who i am this is uh something that stephanie also talks about it in her interview i think when talking about um mine 1979 that october uh read a few lines from uh, i think a few minutes ago and um you know one of the things she says is that in talking about children you know children for children it's socially acceptable to have really big feelings about really small things um and and i think it's very true um, I think about, you know, going to the grocery store with a young child and they see something on the shelf that they want. Um, and, and most parents probably had this experience or something like it. Um, and they, you know, scream and cry and flop down on the floor and you know, pandemonium. And, um, and everybody looks on and says, okay, well, that's a kid, right? That's, that's what kids do. But all the judgmental eyes are on the parent. How are they going to manage this situation? Um, and and in, in parenthood, which is one of the themes that, that Stephanie um, addresses in, in this collection of poetry as well, you know, I think uh, many parents are, are familiar with um, this overwhelming sense of powerlessness that, that we can be faced with in, in the, um, the wake of our children's emotions. Um, a, a mentor of mine tells a story um, about when her child was very young, they were driving in a car and the sun um, was shining in her child's eyes. And the child said, mom, move the sun. <laughs> and I think it was this moment of, of recognizing, um, you know, the, the ways in which people and parents in particular are powerless. You're always, you're always in control, even though when you're not, you really have to believe it. And, and it's okay once in a while to feel powerless and that's perfectly fine. But at some point, you know, you have to learn your ways to take, I mean, I was powerless for 55 years, you know, and and you, you can find it, you know, we got to really teach. Like I, I try to tell like a lot of the kids that I see in my groups and stuff when they say, oh, it's never, it's never going to happen. And then I'm never, you know, I keep telling them you have the power and we're going to learn to help you find that. It's, it's just so important. It's just so important to do that. I love all the, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Um, before we go on, I just want to touch on something that both uh, Naomi and Jillian touched on, which is just like the power that comes in telling your story um, and the beauty and strength for, of that. Um, I think one of the things, especially about the most recent protest, has been the mo one of the most impactful things for me is to hear the stories of Black folks talk about their experience. Um, and I, my hope in the future would be we create spaces, including religious and spiritual spaces, in which we can uplift and center stories like the trans experience to bring power and love into them. I think that's really, really a great point. Um, and I just want to note, I love all of the ways that people have talked about sort of taking their feelings of powerlessness and changing them into something that makes them feel more powerful. Um, and I think that that is one way to think about this. Or, you know, just as Jillian was saying, you know, saying, saying okay, right now I don't have the power. So I can't change. The power. Um, but, you know, this is this is a way that I'm going to sort of think about um, think about the situation and move forward and, and think about responding to those uh, judging. <laughs> um, but I think October, what you were saying really is is important. And that leads us to sort of a, another question of, you know, the power of words, right? The spoken word, the written word. And, you know, what is the importance of this in our own experience? You know, thinking about this book of poetry, thinking about our own experiences, you know, how do we take that and move that forward? I think sort of going along with uh, what October and Christy, you're both saying, like, 
telling your story and claiming the words and claiming, um, you know, having is, is a form of power and then being able to put it out there in some way. I mean, like publishing this book, you know, Stephanie's book, um, you know, putting it online, et cetera, but, but really being able to share your words and control the words that you use about yourself, about your experience. Um, I think that's so true in the mental health world when we talk about, you know, there are all these, you know, sort of um, like recovery versus, um, you know, stability, right? Or, I, I, I mean, I'm okay with being stable, but I really want to like have a full and rich and fulfilling life. And sometimes people talk about getting, you know, um, getting people with mental illness housing versus finding a home. Like the the the, the difference in those, you know, words has such a, an, an emotional valence for all of us, um, and also conveys meaning and and how you know I think people see themselves as well as um, others see them. So I think that, that that's such an important point. Definitely. Definitely. I remember the first words. I always knew it was transgender since I was five. And I said it in my head and I said it in my head. Well, I mean, the word wasn't even invented until I was much older. However, knowing it and saying it, totally different. Um, the first time I spoke the words was to my therapist and it took me two years to come out to my therapist. <laughs> and, but when I said the words to her, I'm transgender. It was a room, a room spinning air, taking air out of the lungs moment, shaking, sweating, and just saying those words. And um, it, it's a feeling that moment at those seconds, I'll never forget. And, um, and it was a release. It just it just opened it up. It opened up the whole dam to to a much better life. But you're right. Like knowing it and saying those words was was something like you know it was the best thing I ever did. Obviously, and like and right now I'm in the process of writing a survival book for older transgender population. And as I'm writing this stuff, and it's always been in my head, but as I type it and then I say it, it's so has such a it's a, when I say a different meaning it's a more of a powerful meaning in it and it's bolder and um so yeah yeah saying those words putting them on paper saying them out loud takes on such a huge and just a, just an amazing meaning mm -hmm. I definitely okay um I really relate to like sort of finding yourself in the words, as you said, Jillian. I remember a couple years ago, um, I was in a some sort of workshop, seminar sort of thing where the person insisted on using um, men and women. Um, it just really stuck to it. Um, and so I remember going home and writing out like men and women and then sort of like drawing a chair on the and and drawing me because I feel like I was just sort of sitting on the and. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, I feel like sort of a lot of non-binary experiences sort of reading between the lines of um, gender, sort of peering through the blinds and seeing what's there. And I think that one of Stephanie's poems after Callimachus, she writes about sort of how folks are signaling who they are. And she talks about it through Tumblr and hash, mar hash marks on trees, um, secrets, folded up pieces of paper. And I think that that really resonates with me as someone who sort of like hunted around for the right words and sort of rummaged around and found um, non-binary as a really, as a dear word to me and my name as such a very dear and precious thing to me. And so I think that that's really where I see language especially um, come into my own experience. And of course, speaking from like a religious perspective, um, some religious communities have sacred texts and some don't, and it's kind of all over the board. And I think that, but one of the things in common is communities have languages that they speak together. 
And I think that finding yourself within that language as a trans person is so, so important, or at least finding a community that will invite you into their language. Um, I, for instance, in the field of Christian theology, there are people who read the sacred text for Christians, which is the Bible, um, from like the lens of a non-binary person or a trans person. So they take a story that's in the Bible and they sort of read it as if um, there was trans characters or in it or the trans experience, or they're able to sort of say, well, from this perspective, this could be seen as a coming out story and really be able to, to sort of dive in to the language of the community and see themselves there. I really like that idea of um, finding different ways to, to tell and understand stories. Um, and I think that's a, a large part of what therapy is about, is providing a space for people to tell their stories and to come to understand them um, and to build narratives um, around their, their past and themselves that resonate with them um, and that they can sort of understand and and work off of um and so you know words words are clearly a very important part of that and um jillian as you shared just even kind of saying the words um mm. out loud for the first time yeah sounds like a remarkable moment it really was i i wish i i wish i saw, i wish somebody filmed it <laughs> i wish somebody recorded it i said film see i'm old i wish somebody <laughs> recorded it because it's a moment i wish you know um, I could have seen, but yeah, it was remarkable. Can I can I just say something about really religion? I I wanted to say this earlier because you know um, I love having October here. It's funny because when in transitioning, I also my religion also transitioned with me. Um, I was grown. I grew up Catholic, and of course, you know when I came out and realized this wasn't you know, accepted by the church, you know I felt I did like my religion. I felt abandoned. And I became very angry at God, you know, because now you abandoned me. Uh, why did you do this to me? You know, I hate you. Stop praying. Did all that stuff. And then it's funny. Then as a transition mm -hmm. and settled, and I became very happy. The path that God chose for me was not clear until recently, mm -hmm. and I went from hating God to like loving God and, and I am so happy with the life that I he chose for me, my path. It took me a while to learn it, but I just want to make that point because, you know, there's so, I know a lot, I talk to a lot of trans people who are, you know, they're, they're really angry with religion and I don't blame them. I went through it too, yeah. but your path is, you're going to know your path. You agree with me, October, you're going to know your path. Absolutely. And man, that time of like, sort of desert, figuring it out, <laughs> yelling at God, man, that's tough stuff. And it's <laughs> super needed stuff. Yeah. Talk about words. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But I just, yeah. I mean, you want, yeah, that's what I mean. And I think it's so important to know um, and to remember and don't give up whatever the faith, don't give it up because it's going to come back and it's going to be there for you to help you and help you grow. So I think that, you know, this is such a really important, you know, piece of the conversation. Talk about words. You know, we read the words, the book, you know, that we were all reading and thinking about the power of these words, our words, you know, written word versus spoken word. Um, and even, you know, Becca, as you were talking about, um, you know, the words that we use for other people, right? What's written, you know, what are policies and procedures? What are those words? What do they mean? You know, thinking about that right now, thinking about religion and those, you know, sacred words and what do they mean, you know, for us um, and for others as well. And I, what I also heard in there is this idea of belonging, right? And how do these words help us find belonging, right? Which is something that we have been talking about, um, you know, before. And I think it's really important, you know, and it's something that I think a lot of folks are trying to do is find, you know, where do they belong? Who do they belong with? How do we do that? How do we express openness from one side, right? And how do people express that they feel comfortable, you know, another? Which is something that I think that we're still all trying to figure out. I think, you know, also related to this um, is this idea of hope, 
right? And, um, and right now in America, we are continuing to see the narrative of marginalized folks be cut short. And so how do we express and how do we engender hope for our youth and also living in current times? This, this is a really hard one um, for me. I think at times like this that it's easy to lose hope. Um, and I think the, the, it's necessary first to acknowledge that, that feelings of hopelessness um, are a normal human response, um, but they don't necessarily mean that there isn't hope to be had. Um, and, and I really find myself looking to young people um, with hope. And, you know, the, the younger generations have just completely had it, and rightly so, right, with climate change and, and racial inequity and social injustice, financial insecurity, gun violence, you know, you name it. Um, and, and I see that, you know, they're not sitting at home with their heads in their hands. Um, they're, they're getting out um, and making their voices heard and, and demanding change. Um, and, you know, Generation Z is more than 25% of the population, and they've already started to reach voting age, and over the next 10 to 15 years, you know, we'll continue to, to reach voting age. Um, so it's really hard for me not to have hope when I think about that. Um, and as a, as a parent and as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, you know, I really want to focus my efforts on on supporting those young people. You know, improving their lives and well-being um, because they they can't change the world on their own, right? We can't put the burden of responsibility on young people, but um, you know, they can do it with with support and with love. I'd echo that just as as a parent. Um, with my my seven and a half year old is hearing about. What is race and racism? What um, what is gender identity? What is you know the experience of of um, people of different sexual orientations, different backgrounds? Like she's hearing that. Where I never heard that as a kid. You know, I, that story was not told to me in any kind of way that was understandable or even spoken about. Um, that was just not something that was that um, was told to me. So I feel like you know I'm hopeful in that I see at least my daughter other kids like that that story being talked about and told and that that um makes me hopeful for what will come next because then you know that, that there'll be a new generation that's you know just more accepting and 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 more you know will create that sense of belonging for all of us i um i'm about to sound very cliche but I'm going to do it um, because I guess maybe because I'm older, but in my life experience, there's always the dark before the light, the rain before the sun, da da da, da all those. It, it's true. There, unfortunately, there has to be these, these and it, it's unfortunate, but there are these dark periods. But I also, in all my years, out of the darkest period, there's always been light and always good comes from it. So I get hope from that, that I know, and even the, even everything we're going through, I know there's going to be a lot of, like it says, change, but a lot of, it just gives me a lot of hope that a lot of good things are going to come out of this. And um, I've experienced it in my life. I've experienced it personally. The fact that I'm still here is... Um, it gives me hope, you know, just all around. Um, so it's it's so hard to see when you when you're in such a, a dark time right now. But I see a lot. I see so much good and hope, not too far off in the distance from all of this. So again, not to sound cliche, but right now maybe we're in just the dark period. But the sun's gonna rise. It will rise. Yeah, I think that 
a lot of this conversation reminds me of one of Stephanie's poems and actually my favorite. It's called To the Naked Mole Rats at the National Zoo. And the poem ends with, they could see you as unfinished or as a mistake. One compared you to several toes. Another called all of you spin tubes, which seems apropos, if rude. And I think that, of course, there's something funny in sort of the idea of these creatures that are awkward looking and that sort of thing. But there also is something like distinctly sad about seeing being seen that way. Um, and there's something distinctly sad about what the, the world that we're living in and the things that are happening around us. And I think that that really calls for some mourning. And I don't know that we are excellent um, at that, especially in the States. Um, but taking some time to be sad and to be angry is so, so important. And to take the time to, you know, talk it out with friends and be there to support one another and make those midnight brownies that make your soul happy, mm -hmm. like mourn. And Julian, I really don't, I think that the, you're right. The cliches are true. And I sort of experienced that this summer, I've decided to grow a garden plot. Um, I would not recommend, it's a lot of work. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that it's, it's very organic -y and all natural and we use compost and it really has been sort of a spiritual experience to watch my like coffee to coffee grinds, use coffee mm -hmm. grinds to go into the compost that's growing, hopefully, um, my <laughs> tomato plant. And like, I really think that that is kind of what mourning does is it smashes up mm -hmm. those feelings. It opens them up, it investigates them and says, we can use something here to grow. And I think that that is sort of exactly what compost is, is once it's sort of embedded in the soil, it helps growth and not like sort of instantaneous, like sprout up, but um, it helps you weather the hard storms and slowly grow the strength and slowly resist the wind. And I really think that you're right, that this sort of morning does bring a beautiful, beautiful life giving after. I can guarantee you it will. Well, I can't guarantee you, but I'm sure, yeah, it will, it will. And it's just through it's just through life, you know, from what I've experienced. And just really quick, the point of like the other day when that when they stripped the transgender people of the health care, you know, I was like, I couldn't breathe. All right. So oh my I was I went crazy. But then today the Supreme Court ruling for LGBT, you know, the, I know I'm sure you're all familiar with that. They ruled that you can't discriminate against, you know, your your sex your sexual orientation or gender identity. And now they're saying that's going to carry over to the healthcare. They can actually fight healthcare, you know, discrimination for trans people. So it was just a quick little dark night and it happened very quickly. So yes. And I love the way you put that October. It's like I just said it generally, but I love I love your analogy with the, with the plant in the coffee grounds. So well put. I think also, you know, hope, um, hope does not mean complacency, right? It's not like, oh, you know, Jillian, I'm sure as you're saying, you're really hopeful that some good will come out of this. That doesn't mean that you're, you know, sitting idly by or that or that anybody should be, right? Um, and I think hope itself can be a call to action mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, is really important in that sense. Oh, by all means. Yeah, I don't, I don't mean just sit back. Right. It's, it's call to action and it's doing yeah. something about it, but it's going... It, it's going to be okay. Yeah, I think that there are so many, you know, so many pieces of that October. Likewise, I love the analogy. Um, I think that it is important. You know, I think all of, all of these things, right? So we are, we have a call to action. People are acting. We are hopeful. We keep hope ourselves. We see hope in our kids. You know, they are getting an education and are thinking about things and much more um, different ways, much different ways than, you know, they were even 10 years ago, right? Um, you know, that that is hopeful to me. 
Um, you know, and also I agree, we have to mourn. We have to mourn what we are experiencing, and what is happening. I think that that's real. And also, I think that we could think of this as compost, you know, this is a part of our composty life right now. And hopefully <laughs> something will come from this and, you know, we will all grow um, and, be, and have hope. I'm mm -hmm. noting the time. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, are there final thoughts uh, from our panel? Jillian, I, I didn't know. I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, that's okay. No, I was, I was just going to say, like, read any history text, <laughs> you know, get into any history and you'll always see the cycle. But um, no, no, I, I loved, I love that we discussed this. Um, I love the book, the poetry. As a trans woman, of, you know, as an older trans woman, I think this is a great book. I really never got into poetry, but this has really made me cry. So how do you like that? It was it was a very one to the other. And I'm so glad that we were able to discuss this. And I loved everybody's insight, you know. And so personally, thank you, trans woman. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or comments? I will admit I'm not a poetry uh, person, if that is ever such a thing, you know? <laughs> so I think that for a lot of our group, this was this is also something that we grew in, is learning how to read poetry effectively. Definitely. Absolutely, and have truly enjoyed the experience and as the sort of residential young person, um, <laughs> <laughs> have really, um, loved hearing the hope that you all see in my generation and yeah we're doing amazing things and um i'm really excited for what the future holds and i'm i'm so thankful for the wisdom around this virtual circle as well as the wisdom from stephanie um on these issues Well, I'm fighting for your generation to the end. So <laughs> as I'm breathing, I'm fighting. <laughs> Christy, you, you said, um, you know, you haven't been a, a poetry person, right? Um, and it occurred to me that it's a lovely example of the ways in which identity can continue to shift. <laughs> you can become a poetry person. <laughs> Uh, and I think, you know, we, we, we've talked as, uh, as a panel as we've sort of uh, prepared for this about how for some of us this has taken us out of our, our comfort zone, you know, that, that poetry is not necessarily the, the medium that we're most used to consuming. Um, I think it's been a, a great learning process and, and really transformative. And um, I'm just so honored to, to have been able to be here and, and speak with you all about it today. I'm so grateful to each of you. Um, thank you so much for being here on the panel with me and talking about these things and sharing your thoughts. Um, and I just really, really appreciate each and every one of you. So much love. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, I hope um, I hope others enjoyed the conversation. I haven't seen. I've seen some comments. I hope everybody here has seen them as well. Um, I haven't seen any questions. I should say. Um, uh, so with that, I, I thank you all for being here, and um, I look forward to our next book for YGP uh, that we will read with poetry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, take care, everybody. Have a great thank rest you. of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.